Well, I think the first thing that uh, we all want to say, uh, not just associated with this project, but others too, is that these additions that Addressing History have brought to the history of Edinburgh are very welcome. As Bob Morris said, uh, there is a real dearth of material which needs to be expanded and uh, explored on Edinburgh history. And compared to some other towns and cities, Edinburgh, despite its size and wealth, is poorly served in terms of the published history compared to perhaps Glasgow, dare I say, or Liverpool or Manchester, or some of the other great uh, cities. So when, as uh, Chris said, uh, I came back to Edinburgh a few years ago, one of the things that I was particularly keen on to, was to see that there would be a greater prominence to the history of Edinburgh, which I think it deserves. So I and others welcome the Addressing History initiative and see it, as you've said, and others too, that it's got to have a sustainable and ongoing future, and, and I'm sure it will. I think one of the things which is really good about it and which is something that academics can learn from is that it's a genuinely public history or community history perspective. Uh, a lot of the history that's done in universities and other places tends to remain there. And I think it's uh, this interaction between the local the community history the academic history which will eventually prove uh, very fertile for Edinburgh and other places. Well, address-based history, as Bob Morris said, is vital to historians. It's difficult to think of any particular topic which is more useful, a single topic, more useful to historians. We've heard about the rate books and the census and the wills and all the rest of it, and there are, are many others too. After all, when we're asked for our own identity, we're often asked for a utility bill with our address on it. And still that's a really important dimension to the way we record data about people. In earlier times, of course, things like hearth taxes or archaeological record have got that spatial turn that Bob Morris referred to, got a spatial or a clustering or a distribution associated with it. And so we don't actually need to have data which has got postcodes on top of it straight away. Because with the location, as with a dig or somebody's hearth tax, we actually can find out pretty accurately where that is and assign it a postcode. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility to do that. So addressing history in the best sense really will enrich our historical understanding. Now, as Chris said, we've been doing various other things which are connected to um, ver well, various kinds of spatial representation of Edinburgh data. And this team, which you saw uh, uh, on the board, first of all, um, has been exploring what I describe as anti-GIS. We want, I particularly want, to ensure that we do not put barriers in the way of local historians, undergraduate and other students, who have then to conf are confronted with a ferocious learning curve in terms of some understanding of geographical information systems. So our philosophy is really to avoid that, to develop tools, techniques, and easy customer interfaces, I think I'm inventing jargon there, um, which will enable users quickly and easily to develop maps. Now, this has just put the kiss of death on what we're going to do, of course, but in my own classes, I've been able to get students who've never done this sort of thing before to get a map, a historical map of occupations or activities or the addresses of uh, clubs or institutions or the ministers of the Free Kirk, any of these things in 20 minutes. From having a list of data, I send them to the directory, I ask them to copy down 50 items, come back to class, and we actually map that there and then in front of them and put that into a kind of... Um, I suppose it's an electronic midden, really, where we just collect this information. We can then share 
the opticians, with the medical specialists. We can look at the bakers and the butchers and the candlestick makers all together or separately. So that's been the approach of this. Now, since I'm talking about teaching, there's always a handout, isn't there? So here's a handout. You've got one. So here's a handout about the project. And uh, I hope uh, you'll enjoy what we have to show and say. I've been involved with directories in England for about 10 years. And there, the approach was to use the counties of England and the cities within the counties and to choose a directory in every decade that we could find. So hundreds of OCR uh, directories throughout England. London was a particular problem. So this is, addressing history is taking us into a new uh, horizon, I think, with the digitizing of this data, and I, I see it as being very promising. This is the point at which I think one might be reminded of the NLS list of maps. Um, we heard earlier about how many there were, and I think it's, it's crucial. We're in the NLS. We should glory in the fact that there is this list of digitized town maps. Some of you will consult this, I'm sure, on a daily basis, and for others it may be entirely new. We've been working on Edinburgh because, as I said, I'm interested in developing the historical depth of research in, in Edinburgh, but we particularly think that what we're doing applies really to any of the maps that uh, the NLS, or, well, many of the maps that the NLS has undertaken to digitize. Here is our list of maps which have been digitized and uh, georeferenced as part of uh, the project. And there are others in other uh, towns and cities where the types of techniques which we'll show in a moment could be applied, will be applied, I'm, I'm quite sure. The advantage of what we're trying to do, I think, is that you can obtain data, nominal data, from almost any source. Often, we as historians, geographers, people interested in towns and cities, maybe only have 50, 80, a couple of hundred addresses. We don't need to strip this out. We don't need OCR. We can just make a list of the things we want and then de develop the map pretty quickly. So this is the approach that we want to adopt in our project, the Visualizing Urban Geographies project, whereby we take historical data, nominal data, and relate it to a map of the appropriate period. Now it's really quite tricky to interpret the plots on the map unless it's related to a map of the period. So for example, when those students that I mentioned were doing their mapping, I'd say to them in advance, what distribution, a priori, what distribution would you expect from your occupation, let's say they're medical practitioners? And you'd find, of course, there'd be nothing west of Haymarket. And they'd say, well, that's a bit strange. You'd say, well, actually, no, because in 1850, you're almost at the frontier of the city here. You need to have the map that's germane to the historical data. So we're trying to create a list of maps which will be usable for data spread really through the period from about 1780 down to about 1940. What we'd like to do next is, in a way, strip some of the data out of the Addressing History project. And what we're going to try and do is use the example of bakers and see where they are. Now, I should say, this is the get-out clause, a project's got four or five months to run yet, so this is not even the beta version, but it's probably the gamma one at, at, at best. So here is what you, we do when going to that data. Find from the Addressing History Project, 1865, 
the bakers, here they are. So it produces the list. Um, the address comes up very, very quickly. Here, here we have our spots, our bakers. Now, off the top, of course, we don't know about the imperfections that uh, Bob Morris has referred to, the problems that exist. And, uh, but what, one of the things that I think is quite useful, sort of statistically quite useful, is that if you have a lot of these measly spots all over the place, and have a decent size of sample, we can get some sense of the clustering and the concentrations that take place. We may not here have an absolutely cast iron publishable piece of work, but I think we would have some hypotheses or some ideas about what we might explore. I've noticed, for example, that quite a lot of these retail outlets are on, shop cor on street corners. Well, we know that because we can see them. But you don't always know that in a city that you don't or aren't familiar with. And it conforms to sort of theoretical and, and documentary evidence as well. Builders knew that they could get more rental out of the ground floor properties and particularly out of the corner properties. So there was then, a, you would hardly call it cross subsidization, but there was an opportunity then to get maximum rental out of the ground floor in the corner plot with a retailer and spread lower rentals effectively through the rest of the property and try and keep it uh, uh, reasonably tenanted. So here's how that addressing history works. And here against this are the maps. I didn't see which one you used there. So it's the, uh, Is it the sixth? Right. So that's the 1852 one. But since all of these are here, it's possible to switch uh, to any of the other ones, supposing we want a different map. Since these are all georeferenced and available, it's possible to use the same data and just switch it. So it might have been better to have had it on one of the others, or you perhaps want to look at this in relation to some other data from a different period. Let's do something similar, but move away from the addressing history material, but based still on um, uh, addresses. I want to consider solicitors and advocates in Edinburgh moving away from the addressing history dates, but looking at 1861 and 1911 and see what we get from this. Now this is a list of data which Stuart has got here. It's just in a, an Excel format. Uh, we tell it that it's in Edinburgh rather than in Dunedin or somewhere else. And just in case there should be confusion about New Streets, John Streets, and everybody else's streets, we tell it it's in the UK. So this is just a cut and paste into a routine, a geocoding routine, which gives the data that you saw Bob put up. First of all, similar sorts of things, the, the uh, locational, the latitude and longitude. So this is going on quickly. It builds up. Uh, we think there are about 150 observations in this. And what I want to do is to look at the spatial distribution of solicitors and advocates at two points in time and test the idea that there's something going on and I've got a suggestion about what's happening. So, um, while I've been talking, have, you, have we got the solicitors in 1861 here? Oh. This is the Blue Peter version with the uh, one that we did in the oven. So here we have the solicitors and the advocates, 1861. Can you just split them up a wee bit for us? So just um, right. It's fairly evident that we have the networks are pretty tight. We all know that in Edinburgh. We know exactly uh, the nature of uh, these, these sorts of uh, relationships. 